Hey guys, got a show, a full show for you today. A lot of uh, questions coming up, I understand, and a lot of things to talk about. So uh, I want to get into it uh, right away. L you know, my, my girl over here, Lil's, got her spot. She's right on her spot. <laughs> She's on her mark. She's on her mark. I mean, <laughs> she loves this. It's, it's, ama I, it's amazing. She knows. Monday live, bing, Lily gets a spot, and uh, she don't even move. Oh, Lily. You ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. I'm How ready was your to weekend? get into it. What'd you I do mean, on the weekend, uh, boss? I, huh? What'd you do on the weekend? what I do on the weekend? Mm hmm uh, Work, sleep, work, sleep, <laughs> work, and sleep. I mean, I got to start hiring people, but... You know, it's good to, you know, we're doing a lot of things. Some of the things I'm going to talk about during this interview, um, during this Q&A, I mean, uh, we did some interviews, a couple of big ones. I'll talk about it uh, once we get started. Um, things are going good. Just a little hectic. We were just talking, me and Anna, and try to figure out, you know, if some of these things click, how do we... Do it, and I told her. Simple answer is we're gonna have to hire really qualified people who are in different areas. Um, so uh, let's start off, and then we'll see where we go. Okay, let's start off real quick. Just give a couple of shout-outs to your crew in the chat. We have Xavier James, Mad Koo, Christian Nettleshev, Jay Marie, Danny Murphy, Sean McPeak. Francisco Horn, a Mets fan, and Mike Holmes out of Canada. Wow. Say, wow. Give him a shout out, Sammy. Okay, so let's get, in, let's get into the um, questions from last week. We have uh, Derek Jorgensen. No question. He just wanted to say, Sammy, love your stories from Derek and Kiki. We have Gas Can Lip who asked last week, Sammy, when you pass away, hopefully a thousand years from now, do you think you will have a mob sit down in heaven with Neil De La Croce and Carlos Gambino? Um, I've already made arrangements for that. <laughs> so it's, that's a definite. <laughs> and I'm waiting for an answer back. Okay, very abrupt. I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> it would be a pleasure sitting at a table with them two guys I mean I really would okay so we have Adam Bruford hope you're well Sammy do you think you and Michael Francis would have been a good partnership knowing him well now uh, that's a great question I, I need a second to think about that um, but the answer I thought about it is yes Michael Francis was a dynamite uh, racketeer and I think I was a pretty good um, gangster so I think together the gangster and the racketeer and I do like Michael so I think it would have been a great pair okay we have John Alex Dennis who says what would you say to Gotti if you met him in heaven well Another heaven question. I think... Uh, it is very morbid today. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I know everybody would want me to say that, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm really not. I'm sorry I didn't kill you, and I probably would kill him in heaven. I mean, it's, he, I, you know, I love the guy. I said it a hundred times. I did love the guy, but, but the betrayal... You know, love and hate are on, you know, a very thin line. And what he did to me, I, I, I just can't forget it. You know, I forgive him. It's over. He passed away. I don't want to talk negative about him. But um, it really did hurt me a lot. Okay, we have Pizza Dave. Speak a little louder. Be up. What? <laughs> We have Pizza Dave. Can you hear me now, Sammy? Yes, I hear you, yes. <laughs> Pizza Dave says, did you have any dealings with Larry Mazza? 
Um, I knew Larry Mazza on the street. He was with uh, the Grim Reaper there, Greg Scarpa Sr. I had limited, um, you know, meetings or anything to do with him, but uh, I knew him. He had a pool room, I believe it was on 86th Street. Um, I talked with him a couple of times since uh, I've come out of prison, but I really don't have too much to say. El Gato asked, Zu Sami Salute, the Lucchese would set up their own people. Is this true? Grazie. That the Lucchese set up their own people? Yeah. Um, I think we all did that. When you break the rules, uh, El Gato, it comes from your own people. Your own people have the, the, the not only the right, but the, the obligation to take care of you and um, it would be your friends and people around you that would bring you in even if they it hated doing that but uh, you got to remember we go by rules you live by the rules and you die by the rules now if you break the rules yeah it's your own people that bring you in and get rid of you unfortunately I know it sounds horrible but that's what happens. Okay. Polly C says, Sammy, I heard an agent say Gotti wanted to whack Paul because Paul chose Tommy Bellotti over him as underboss after Neil died. Is that true? No. I, no. I, Paul would have never, never, ever chose Gotti. Gotti was in very deep trouble. Even if he wasn't in deep trouble, Paul would have never chose him. Um, the, the fear was that um, Paul was going to make Tommy Bellotti the underboss. Almost no question about that. He was going to make Tommy Gambino, his nephew, be the acting boss for him while he's in prison. So he wasn't going to step down. But everybody knew that Tommy was much rougher, bully type of guy. He would have bullied Tommy Gambino very easily and, uh, you know, Everybody knew that, so we knew that you're going to be dealing with him, and uh, so no, nobody was happy with that. Okay, last question comes from Cortez. Uh, Roy DeMeo, Greg Scarpa, Gas Pipe. If you had to decide who took out the most people, who would you put your money on? Uh, Roy DeMeo, without a doubt. Okay, that's it for last week's questions. Anna. Somebody in the chat said, Sammy, get a miracle ear. Get a what? A miracle ear. Get a miracle ear? Like yeah. a hearing aid? You guys, you don't understand. He hears us breathing from like across the office, three rooms away, through the conference room walls. He hears every fucking thing. Yeah, I hear things. <laughs> he hears all the things. He didn't hear me. You no, you know why? I just heard the air conditioner or heater, whatever it is, yeah. went on. So I'm hearing that. It's right over my head. So it makes it a little difficult to hear. So that's about it. But I hear pretty good. What? Huh? See? <laughs> good? She's goading me into that. She told us she got you. Hoo-ha. Hoo-ha. <laughs> Sammy, um, James Shreve in your chat right now, it's his 64th, 65th birthday and he's battling stage three cancer and he's telling you, can I please get it, asking you, can I please get a shout out? Never change who you are, Sammy. You have the shout out, you have my love, my prayers. Um, you know, I, I, I lost friends and family members to cancer. I know what it is. Um, stay strong and, um, uh, Think of all good things, all good memories and stuff like that. Um, there are people who beat it. I hope you beat it. But if you don't, you have 65 years. Think of all pleasant things. Fuck the pain. I know it's hard, but try to put that on the side. Enjoy the, if your wife is alive and your children and your grandchildren and enjoy what you got left for as long as you got left. I wish you the best.
Thank you, Sammy. Um, <coughs> you know, speaking of cancer, you've told the story about Peruta and Redman always asks great questions. The loyal viewer <clears throat> has a little bit of a question here. Um, Sammy, I remember reading your book and when you were talking about the Peruta situation and about the way he passed, I remember when you said about that, what the Hollywood guy thought, the writer. Um, when I read the book, I remember thinking, you told Joe that you would do it. You would take him out. And Joe was happy that he could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Just by you saying yes, that he was finally able to relax. And when he was able to relax and feel comfortable, nature took its course. Just by saying yes, you gave Joe that. I don't think he left to protect you from doing it. I think you got him to relax, which he probably hadn't done in a really long time. Just my thoughts. You know, it's a, it's a great thought. The guy in Hollywood, what he told me and what you're telling me right now, and I, you know, I always felt a little guilty that I didn't do what he wanted. I was about to, I was set up, I had a gun, I had a silence, I had people emptying the house, but he took a turn for the worst, and on the way to the hospital, he died. But I really believe in my heart now that I did give him peace of mind knowing I said yes to his request. And knowing that I was breaking a rule, I didn't care what God he said, I didn't care what anybody said. I didn't care if my own life was on the line. I owed him that and I was gonna do it. But I feel better now knowing that he knew I didn't let him down. I said yes, I would do it, even though it was gonna break my heart and maybe get me killed. Um, yes, I think I gave him peace. Thank you, Sammy. Um, Sheila Brown in the chat. Sammy, I watch all your shows and interviews. I've never missed a one. Um, I had my 12 year anniversary with my husband on St. Patrick's Day. Can I get a shout out? Sheila Brown? Mm hmm. Sheila Brown, I love you, and I keep watching them. I, we're getting better and better. I said I was going to say a few things. I um, have a couple of interviews coming up uh, f with females, uh, two very big ones. I don't want to say their names or what they are. They're in negotiation right now, um, and I think they're going to be spectacular. Um, so, God, and I have another one that's in production, but... Let's mm -hmm. see. We'll talk about that one after. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Clark Dro Drover with a weekly envelope for you. No comment, no question. Thank you so much, Carl. Zach in the super chat. My dad is concerned about my fascination with you, Sammy. Will you please reassure him you're a good dude? <laughs> well, I will say that I think I'm a good dude. Um, I try to be now. Um, I think there's a lot worse he could pick than me. Um, I try to help people, so I don't think you'll have anything to worry about. I'll never suggest bad things for your son or to f lead him in a bad direction. If he has a problem with his wife, his children, his, I'm, I, I give the best advice I could give, um, and I think it's always meaningful. I will never give him horrible advice to do something horrible or disgusting or something like that. So I don't think you have anything to worry about. Um, and like I said, I'm not the best, but I'm not the worst person he could be looking at. Um, and that's what I'll tell you, Dad. Sounds good to me, Sammy. It's who you are now, right? It's like the present day, every day is right. great and good. It's who you've become in mm -hmm. life. You know, we all make mistakes in life. We all do stupid things. Uh, some people worse than others, but, uh, and I guess I fit that category, but uh, it's what you become. It's what you are now, what you do every single day of your life now. And I, I do good things. I help people, I talk to people, I try my best. A lot of people have told me there's a lot of people sending you messages and questions you can't answer. I see some of them who are sick or some of them who have a problem with a kid. And I just, if it takes me hours, I can't help it. I'm over there answering and giving advice and help it to the best of my ability. And that's all anybody could ask of anybody. 
Thank you, Sammy. Matt S. in the super chat, if you were given a contract and had to choose John Carniglia, Eddie Lino, Bobby Borriello, or Charles Carniglia as the shooter, who would it be and why? Well, I wouldn't choose Charles Carniglia because um, he became a little evil in his life that I knew. Um, Johnny Carnig, Eddie Lino, Bobby Borriello were all good men. Um, they were all shooters. Um, they would not get into any gory stuff. They would just shoot you and kill you without trying to make you suffer. So I would pick all three, any one of them. I mean, uh, they were top guys. Uh, they had compassion for people, but they did what they had to do. And that's what made them uh, good men all the way around. So I would pick any one of them. Um, if the hit was on me, I would pick those three guys to do it to me. Wow. That's wow. how much I respect them. And that's going to sound weird, I guess, but uh, that's my answer. Thank you, Sammy. You know, um, is it Charles Caniglia, the one that you and Gene and Anthony Reggiano sat down and talked about, about the souvenirs and all that stuff? Yes. And I don't like none of that ghoulish bullshit or, or serial killer type of shit. I don't, I'm not into none of that. I don't like it. I don't like them. Um, but a man who's doing what he's got to do, they're soldiers, they're warriors, they were tough, they were efficient, and they didn't try to uh, make anybody suffer or do anything like that. They just did what they had to do, like a soldier. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I think uh, I have a ton of respect for all three of them and uh, in this question. Brett Airson in the super chat. Boss, could you please give my big brother Jason a happy birthday shout out? He turned 50 yesterday and he watches you every Monday. Happy birthday, Jason, and thank you so much for watching. Frank Logan, what was it like working with the Westies under Paul compared to Gotti? Um, I didn't work too closely with the Westies. I knew them. I knew quite a few of them. Um, Fogarty was one of them, and I really loved the guy. I'm still in touch with him. I have a ton of respect for him. Um, and again, you know, some of them were were bent uh, out of shape a little bit. I, don't, I didn't deal with them. Um, I dealt with the, the cream of the crop uh, when it came to them. Uh, I didn't do many things with them. Um, they were an Irish crew. I dealt with some of them even with union stuff. They had a big steel company and they had a connection with the steel workers. The iron workers, they had something to do with the union. So I dealt with them with construction and things like that. I didn't deal with too many other things with them. So it was construction, stuff like that. Um, Fogarty, um, I did time with him. I not only knew him on the street, I did a lot of time with him. We became really, really tight. Um, when he got out of prison, uh, I was out a few years and we talked and I went down. It's too late for him to get in trouble, so I went down and I put together a little package of money and I gave it to him to start his life, gave him some advice. Um, he was good with heavy equipment and uh, he took my advice, he took it. When I got out of prison recently, he gave me a call, he came and he gave me a little package of money so I could help start my life. That's the kind of relationship I know his son. Um, I think the world of him, but um, he was the closest one I dealt with, with the, you know, the Westies. He wasn't a boss of them, but he was a heavyweight, tough guy, tough with his hands, super tough. So. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Um, let's see. Sladen Green, who earns more, an underboss or a consigliere? I don't know who's smarter and who has more things going. I, I guess they both earn very good because money in the mafia, as we all know, an associate gives it to the made guy, the made guy gives to his captain, captain gives it up to his administration. 
So all of the whole administration are doing really, really good money-wise. Um, who makes more? It's up in the air. So. Luke H., a uh, weekly envelope for you. No comment, no question. Thank you. Mets fan. Hey, Mets fan. Loyal viewer. Mets fan. Sammy, do you remember Via Bate Alba on, or Villa Bate Alba on 18th Avenue in Bensonhurst? Absolutely. Alba's was one of the best um, places you go buy, you know, stuff, pastries, pastries and stuff like that. Alba's was great, and I, I'll probably never forget it. When you went to the bakery, what did you usually get? What was your favorite pastry? Ganolis was one of them. <laughs> but I, there was a lot of cookies. I forget the names of them, but I loved that they had the seeds on them. There was so much, so many good things. Uh, and, and usually if they're making bread or they're making pizza, a lot of bakeries, they even make pizza, not by the pies, but by the slices and stuff like that. So they, there's a few of them, but Albers was one of the best. Nice. Ryan Brown, Sammy, it is my 41st birthday this Friday. Could I please get a shout out and a happy birthday? Keeping, keep being awesome, Sammy. Thank you, Ryan Brown. Loyal viewer, Ryan's always here. Mm -hmm. Ryan's always chatting it up. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> oh, look here, John Ball. Yep. In retrospect, Sammy, who should have been the boss after Paul was gone besides Gotti? And who would have made the best boss after Paul? I, I, I always say this, I believe Frankie DeChico would have made the best boss. Um, not only because he was a super tough guy, um, he was an underdog guy. He really always helped underdogs and people like that. Um, you know, we walked on Bath Avenue one time, me, Frankie DeChico, and Angelo Ruggiero. Angelo was more of a buffoon, yelling at people or whatever. And somebody robbed his car, the radio out of his car. Some kids passed us up. They knew who me and Frankie were. They didn't know Angelo. And they says, I got a radio for sale. And we walked over to the car. Angelo hit the kid right away. It wasn't even Angelo's radio. And Frankie stopped him, like, come on, bro. How do you even know if this is your radio? What kind of radio? It turned out it wasn't his radio. And then Frankie told him, they're kids. They steal like we did, bro. What are you hitting them for? That's the type of guy you want as the boss. You know, he, he's 40 underdog. He's a tough guy, no doubt about it. But he was a, always for the, un, uh, for the underdog. Every time I was in trouble and I turned around three inches, Frankie was there. So I, I think Frankie was great. He was like a big brother. He was, 14, I think, 14 years older than me, and he was like a big brother. I idolized him. He was great. Awesome. Thank you, Sammy. Mikkel, hey, Sammy, what's your three all-time honorable or most legendary Cosa Nostra members? Three most loved. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to go to Tato, my mentor, and as much as I love Frankie, I have to go to uh, uh, Stymie and Joe Peruta, and, and I'll bring five, I put four Frankie in there too, even though he wasn't in my crew. And there was other guys in my crew, it's not fair to mention, because Johnny Holmes and even Joey Bellotti, after Tommy Bellotti was killed, was in my crew, and I really got to love him. I saved his life when they wanted to kill him. I was against it. And then John said, well, if he strikes back, because he is a tough guy, he's going to strike the captain. Who are we going to put him with? Right after the hit, I became a full-blown captain. I said, put him with me. And the crazy part of that is that years later, when I cooperated, Joe Watts was trying to scheme with somebody to kill my son. and. Uh, who saved him was Joey Bellotti. I saved his life. He saved my son's life years later. So I got to put him in that group as well. And um, so, and, and there's more guys who are in the crew who were gone. Kid Sarah, Michael DeBat, Nicky Cowboy. I mean, they were good guys. I know they died, but they, they broke rules and they died. But I miss them. I love them. It broke my heart 
but they did, and um, so I won't. I don't want to get into it because I start getting emotional now. So let's go on with another question. All right, Jay Marie, Sammy, how did your meetings go last week? If it was with the studio executives, I can't wait to hear all about it. Listen, they went pretty good. You know what they said? There's we're putting together a pitch deck to go to the network, and. Uh, Last week, that was the second meeting we all had. I won't say the names and everybody was there, but we had the second one. And it looks like there's going to be at least two more before we go to the networks. And they're getting better and better. Um, I like it. I enjoy it. We have fun with it as well. I have a great, great team. I mean, these people are the best of the best. And um, I'm glad I put myself in with these people people um, and uh, it went very well but I'm looking forward to my next meeting with it and I think there'll be two and we'll have it nailed down and we'll give it to the network and as soon as the network signs in that's the first phase the second phase is we start picking a director actors, actresses, camera people, sound people, lighting people, right across the board. When that's done, the third phase is actual production. We start filming and working on it. And it's going great right now. Um, I couldn't be any happier with the people around me, people who were involved. And uh, so uh, it went really good. There you go, Jay Marie. Uh, Demi Vitale, I love when Amina hands me notes. I feel like Walter Cronkite back here. Demi, this just in, breaking news. Demi Vitale is at the bar drinking and wants to know what kind of drink Sammy would order. Because she wants to order it. Oh, she's going to order it? She's going to order it. <laughs> For herself? Yeah. Tell her to get uh, a Tito, a t a Tito's... Um, uh, uh, soda, tea vodka, soda. and uh, soda, or, or the what did I take the the, the cranberries? Mm -hmm. Splash of cran with the lime. Yeah, it's refreshing. with the lime. So either one of those two, I would tell you the whiskey I I drink is Cal uh, Callum uh, Twelve. Mm -hmm. McCallum's. Yeah. McCallum's Twelve, but um, don't drink the whiskey. Drink some vodka. It's a little lighter, and uh, I don't want you to get drunk. <laughs> Whiskey makes you frisky, and bubbles get you in trouble. <laughs> Have you heard that saying, All right, I had to come up with some uh, frisky sta statements. <laughs> Not guilty. Okay. Brava wants to know, what's up, Sammy? Any heavyweight Mexicans you crossed path paths with in federal prison that made an impression on you? Oh, there were so many tough Mexicans in prison. I mean, you know... They outdo the Italians because they, they, they go in in droves. They get busted left and right, these poor bastards. But there's a lot, a lot of guys um, that I was friendly with. I don't want to mention names and stuff like that. But there's a ton of them who are really, really good people. Um, and uh, some I still get along with. Um, but a lot of them, they do some heavy time too. It seems like the Italians and the Mexicans and the blacks we do a lot of time when we go to prison. For some reason, you know, a lot of the other, not only the races, uh, the whites, but the nationalities, it's not the color of your skin, it's the nationality or your religion or whatever. Like I said, you know, a lot of people ask me about Vietnamese or, um, or Chinese, or I saw, saw very few of them. So I don't know, like I always say, either they're good crooks and they don't get caught, or they're good people and they really don't do too much, you know. Pizza Dave, Sammy, how powerful was Jimmy Brown? I did a lot of talking about him. I mean, he was in a powerful position because he was a captain. He was friendly with Paul. Um, he was the head of the Garbage Association, so he's bringing in a lot of money, and he had a club on 86th Street right next to Tommaso's. Paul loved going to Tommaso, so he would go to the club first. But Jimmy Brown was a fucking mutt, as far as I'm concerned. I did a lot of stories about him. Um, 
My Tato didn't like him, um, but he did have power. Uh, when Frankie De Chico was killed, and I, I don't want to go through the whole story. We put him in a van, police van, and they took him away. Um, and I went across the street. There was 20, 30 guys. Jimmy Brown and Danny Marino told me, Sammy, well, go home. If you need us, call us. And Paulie Zach just exploded. Go home. He fucking needs you now. Look what just happened. So I said, Paulie, Paulie, not now. Go ahead, go the fuck home. I mean, Paul Isaac and guys like that stood there, ready to do whatever. I mean, I don't, we didn't know what to do. What I did is, I'm going to tell this really quick story. I, I went, my brother-in-law came back and said, I spoke to John on the phone, he wants you to come to Queens. Um, I went around the corner where my car was parked on 85th Street and 15th Avenue, it's about a block away. And uh, I got in the car, and uh, I was afraid to put the key in the ignition after what I just saw with Frankie. He was blown to pieces. I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and I turned the key. Nothing happened, and I took a deep breath out. Um, and I went to Queens and saw John Gotti, and I said, uh, he said, I sent Joe Watts to the hospital where he is. He died on the way there. He was dead. And I remember telling Gotti, I guess it's me and you against the world, bro. Losing Frankie the Chico was losing everything, especially to me. Um, so that's what happened uh, at that moment, and... Uh, you know, I was really paranoid about turning that key. But uh, I said, if it is, it is. I closed my eyes, took a deep breath, and turned that fucking key. When I heard the motor going, and nothing happened. I drove out to Queens. So wow. Jimmy okay. Brown was, and we found out later, 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 that they kind of knew, Jimmy Brown and Danny Marino, that Chin and gas pipe and them were making a move. They never told us. If they would have told us, maybe that thing wouldn't have happened that day. So I, I, I can't stomach him. He did something against a friend of mine, uh, Louise, and people, I don't want to get into all those stories, but right. uh, I didn't like Jimmy at all. Yeah, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of reasons. Yeah, why. there's three or four stories, and uh, yeah. I don't think he was a man's man at all. Thank you, Sammy. Big earner. Yeah. Let's see. Brett, Sammy, before you and John got pinched, did you ever think John might take you out at some point? No. No, I never thought that. Nicky Scarfo, when I went to see him, um, had told me, uh, Sammy, he, he had called me late at night. It wasn't that late. I got home eight, nine o'clock or whatever it was late. I was tired and I got a message that he wanted to see me in Atlantic City, which was a two hours and 15, 20 minutes away, two hours and 15, 20 minutes to come back. And then I'm going to go to a meeting. I was exhausted, but he wanted me to come. And I went and see him and he told me, he said, Sammy, are you having trouble with this bum? And I said, what bum? Who are you talking about? And he said, your boss, John Gotti. I said, bro, don't talk to me like that. He's my boss, he's my friend, don't talk to me like that. And then I don't want to start talking behind people's backs. He said, Sammy, I, I get it, I'm sorry. He said, he wants me to come in a different way. I always came in through you. He wants to switch it over to Joe Butch. Something's wrong here. And I had told him, listen, I'm doing a lot of work. Maybe he's trying to take some work off my back, you know. He said, listen, Sammy, keep your eyes open. If you need me, me and you got blood on our hands together. 
I did the Johnny Keys hit. He became the boss. And he said, if you need me, I give you the power of my whole family behind you. I thanked him. I shook his hand and I left. And I thought about it all the way on the way home. And uh, it made me think about it, but I always pushed it off because I loved the guy. I never expected him to want to kill me. I was bringing in a ton of money. I was controlling businesses, unions, and everything. John was the boss. I was the power behind the boss. I was the brains behind the boss, if we want to say that. I know some people would say no. Um, some of my haters. But uh, no, no, I didn't really uh, have that feeling. If I would have really had that feeling and had advice like that from Nikki and my crew, I would have killed them. So, no, but I never felt that way. Thank you, Sammy. Eric DuPont Klingshern. Sammy, if you end up getting too busy with work, give me a call and I'll work for you. Have you ever wondered if John knew something when he called you to the Ravenite when you were on the lamb? Like maybe he knew something? A lot, a lot of people ask that question and a lot of people think that way. I don't think so. Um, when he called me in off the lamb, um, it was a dumb fucking move. I was on the, the lamb from October because we knew the indictment was coming. Uh, when I, I even was, when I was told he wants to see you and he wants to see you in, in Little Italy in New York. And I said, why the fuck would he want to do that? I'm on the lam for two fucking months already uh, waiting for this indictment. Why, there's FBI there all the time. There's news media there all the time. Why the fuck would he want me there? And the FBI was looking for me. They went to my house was even an article in the paper, Sammy is missing, presumed dead. I wasn't dead, obviously. Um, but I thought more he might have heard something with the case, and maybe I wasn't on it or something. I don't know. So I went in. But do I think he tried to set me up or do anything like that? Well, that's a rat move. I don't think so. No. No, I, don't, I really don't think so. Um, I don't know why he, he wanted me in. Um, it don't make sense. I had a full beard. People couldn't even recognize me. I never had a beard. And uh, I came home, I believe it was on a Sunday night. There's a whole story with that. Um, I went to bed. I got up in the morning. I took a shower, shave, kissed my wife. I went in with uh, Big Louie and uh, I went to New York to go to the meeting. I walked in, five minutes later, FBI came, NYPD. They, and after I cooperated, they told me, as soon as they saw me, they wanted to get John Gotti, me, and Frankie Lacasio together in one pinch. So while I was gone, they held up the pinch. They didn't want to do it. They wanted to get all three of us together. And when I went in, they just made calls right away. Sammy just walked into the club. John and Frankie are already there. Ten minutes later, they put together teams called NYPD, and they flooded the club, and we were busted. I could never understand it, but I don't think, um, I don't think John would do that. I, it would be, I hope not. I'll never know, but I don't think so. And I'd rather live with that. That, that didn't happen. I hope so. Thank you, Sammy. <clears throat> Fun for Reason wants to know, pizza or pasta? Uh, pizza when I'm on the run. <laughs> and pasta when my ass is sitting down eating dinner. Oh. There's, there's nothing like pasta. Mm. You know, Sicilians, we, um, our families were peasants and farmers. They never had money. Pasta was a main dish with vegetables or pasta basil, all kinds of things. <coughs> so I grew up with it. It wasn't a diet to me. It was just something I always ate and had dinner. So I love pasta. 
even when I go to some fancy restaurants now, when I went to California, I'm always looking at the menu. Do they have pasta? <laughs> They're getting yeah. steaks. They're getting this all kinds of steaks and bullshit. And I'm always looking for a pasta mm -hmm. dish. So I, I love pasta. Zach, um, Zach's the one that earlier asked you the question about, you're a good dude, tell my dad you're a good dude, I'm fascinated. And he said, here's an extra kick up for that great answer, Sammy. You don't have to read this on the stream, just please tell Sammy he's a great boss. Thank you so much, my friend. Guess Can Lip is just coming in with all the political <laughs> questions. <laughs> I'll read this one to you. Sammy, how does Nancy Pelosi's husband stomach Nancy, and what advice would you give to Paul Pelosi? <laughs> oh um, Nancy Pelosi's husband had a guy come over, and uh, by the reports, I'm not saying it because I don't know the guy, but uh, then I think they were lovers, and then a lovers quarrel, and they had a fight, and the guy hit Paul Pelosi, his name is Paul, mm -hmm. and he hit him with a hammer, and the guy got arrested, and then they tried to hush it all up because it was, uh, you know, it was a sexual thing. It started with a sexual thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nancy Pelosi, listen, if I was Nancy Pelosi's husband, I might be in heaven. I, maybe I would be having sex with men. <laughs> I fuck Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Let me take Allegedly. that back. No, because, I'm <laughs> all right, I don't want to take it back. I don't want to take it back. Oh my gosh, fun for reason, back in the super chat. As a boss, who would you prefer, John Gotti or Quack Quack, Angelo? Oh, John Gotti over Quack Quack, for, for, for sure. <laughs> Quack Quack did make no sense. That's John made a little bit of sense. He uh -huh. just, listen, John was good in the beginning. He, he, I said it earlier to someone. He lost control of himself like a typical narcissist. He think I could walk on water. They all love me. Um, when you start thinking crazy like that, crazy shit happens to you. I can't, you're talking in an apartment he should have never been talking in, um, especially about the things he was talking about, murders and every other thing. You know, it's one thing to get, you know, I had 9,000 hours of tapes on me. Um, Diane Sawyer interviewed the agents and everybody. She said, my God, 9,000. You listen to these things? It's every minute of it. And uh, no one got arrested on my tapes, not me or anybody else. And they weren't used in anybody's cases ever. They were a total waste. My office was bugged. There was five bugs in different places. No matter where you went in my office, you were on tape. Um, and my tallies was bugged in a lot of my places. I had a, a place that's on the construction sites, a trailer. That thing was bugged. Everything was bugged. Now, you heard bullshit conversations about sports, um, some girl. No, oh, she's got a great ass. It's some stupid shit, that's what you heard. Nothing uh, that they can go to the, you know, anybody getting busted for. When anybody wanted to talk to me, my crew would grab my arm, touch it, and squeeze it a little hard. I knew that there was something serious that needed to be talked about. No questions asked. I got up, excused myself, whatever I was doing, and went out with him. I took a walk talk somewhere where I knew there was nothing unless the bug was on my body. And I didn't have no bugs on my body. So, you, you, you know, when you're in that life and when you reach a certain point and you know they're bugging you, you got to figure everywhere is being bugged. You got to watch every word you said. So I would meet guys 2 o'clock in the morning when I knew it was going to be a long conversation, an important conversation. You know, Louis called me up, Louis Molino called me up one day. He said, something's important. We got to meet. I said, bro, it's 12, 12.30 at night. Can't wait till, no, no, I got to talk to you. I said, all right. I walked out. He says, I'll meet you on the corner when I lived uh, in Staten Island. And there was a, um, a hotel, motel. 
So he says, come on, we'll go in there and talk. So I mean, I don't forget, we went to the counter and uh, we asked the guy for a room. How long you want to stay? A short, we'll be here a couple hours. Now, as I was talking, I said, because I, I told the guy, a short, a short. You know, if you were cheating or you were with a girl, you, that's what you would ask for, a short. You go there, you'd have sex, you'd stay there for a couple hours and leave. So I look at the guy and he's looking at us and he's smirking. So I said, Louie, we well, just asked for a short. This guy thinks we're, we're gonna go get we're gonna go get laid over here, me and you. So and we laughed and we went to the room. But that's what we did. That's what I did. You know, once I knew it was important, I didn't care what hour, where I had to go, what basement, what backyard, I made sure I, I didn't get caught on a serious conversation. 9,000 hours. When we go to work today, think about all you guys who work. We work a 40-hour week, 40 hours in a week. 9,000, all right, I had a lot of bugs. But it's phenomenal. And when Diane Sawyer asked the agent, then I heard the conversation with her with the agent, and he said, we listened to every second of it. My God. And nobody ever got arrested on my tapes, or they were never used in any case. So... I'm, I hate to brag, but when you're in the life, it's not about bragging. It's, it's whether you're going to go to jail or send people to jail, you better watch what the fuck you say. Yeah. And where you say it. High stakes every day. Mm -hmm. Every day, all day. Sammy, when you had uh, some, some friends in art and all them last week, who was the guy, what's the story of the lawyer doing like this grand reveal and popping up? from a chair in the courtroom, like he presented himself and he like popped up from behind. Oh my God, we were on the floor. That was, uh, that, <laughs> that was uh, John Gotti's original lawyer. Um, what the fuck was his name again? Cutler, was it Bruce? Yeah, Bruce Cutler. So I had a case when I was cooperating and there was a whole drama in the courtroom. Bruce Cutler was gonna question Sammy the Bull. So I came in, I was on the stand, and uh, I didn't see him. So there was a table, there was a couple of chairs, and nobody there. So I was saying to myself, he didn't show up? Where is he? And then he just popped up, jumped up out of the thing. The, the, the jury was just hysterical laughing. And it was Unreal. meant to scare me, I guess, or... Stunned the court. I don't know what it was. Where was he standing? He was a fucking jerk off. Listen, I told. <laughs> fit, let me finish this story. The the underboss in Chicago reached John Gotti, and uh, he told John Gotti he asked if he can use Bruce Cutler as a lawyer. So John Gotti sent word back, and I was part of it. Bruce Cutler's a fucking dope. He's not a good lawyer. He's dramatic. He does crazy things in the court. Uh, but why John was beating cases is not because of Bruce Cutler. It was because me and other guys were rigging trials, threatening people, bribing people. That's how he was beat. So Bruce Cutler was winning one case after the other. So he was getting the reputation as a great lawyer. But he told the underboss. Now the underboss was pinched with four or five other guys. Everybody had different lawyers. The underboss took Bruce Cutler. At the end of the case, they all beat the case except for the underboss. Wow. He's the only one who lost. Oh my God. <laughs> and I said, John, you're going to tell him about, send a message back. We told you that he sucks. Oh so that's the story with Bruce Cutler. And Hilarious. I, I think he's still alive. My, maybe he's going to be knocking my brains in now. Okay, created for so much more in the super chat wants to know why did Johnny Keys have to go? Now, there was a war, and uh, there was two sides. It, uh, it ended up with uh, Mickey Scarfo against Johnny Keys, and the whole New York, all the five families were against Johnny Keys, and um, they couldn't kill him. There was bodies all over the place, but he had to go. Um, the Genovese people, 
um, had ties with Nicky Scarfo, so they wanted him to win to further their enterprises to have operations going more into Jersey, onto the piers with Nikki. If Nikki wins, they could control him and uh, he's under their thumb, so to speak. So, and that didn't come out right away, that came out later, but uh, that's just the way it was. It was a commission ruling. Uh, yeah, the commission is more powerful than any individual boss. So when it's a commission, vote that the whole, well in this case, the whole commission was against him. Uh, the Genovese convinced everybody that that's the way it should go and that's the way it went, but it didn't work out like that. Thank you, Sammy. Let's see, Eric DuPont Klingshern back in the super chat. I love the Diane Sawyer interview. I love how you just relented. I'm a gangster, I'm gangster. It was like she was not expecting to hear you say that. Does anything stand out about that interview that you reflect on now? I loved the, the interview. I really had a ton of respect for Diane Sawyer. She's a good woman. Um, I'm going to tell you a few things. I hope she don't get mad at me because she's still alive. We were filming and, you know, they stop and they change the batteries in the cameras and everything. And then they started again. And uh, the, a, a woman came down, Lisa Soloway. She was a producer. She was Diane Sawyer's head producer. And uh, she made it all possible to happen. So when they stopped with the cameras, Lisa Soloway had to go to the bathroom and she left. So she said, Sam, you got a tremendous sense of humor. Do you want to joke a little bit? I said, uh, sure. How? How? I didn't want to joke. She said, when Lisa comes back, I'm going to ask you, the cameras or nothing, the sound, nothing will be on, she, but she'll think it's on. Would they put that clipboard in front of your face? They do all of that. She's going to ask me, Sammy, what made you do this interview? And uh, what do you want me to say? Say something about Lisa. I'll say, uh, Lisa had sex with me, that's why I'm doing it. So she started laughing, the whole, the whole team was laughing. Yeah, 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 let's do that. So they set all the equipment up, they reloaded, but they didn't start it. The guy come, Lisa Sawe came back, she was sitting down. They clipped the board right in front of my face. Okay, Sammy, we're starting. And Diane saw as serious as cancer, said, Sammy, what made you do this interview with me? I said, well, you know, Lisa Soloway would talk to me from prison, and when I got out, I was talking with her. And we had a meeting, and uh, she had sex with me, and I, I said, okay, I'll do it. Lisa Soloway jumped up. <laughs> you lying fuck. I didn't do that. So and the whole fucking staff, everybody busted out laughing. So she realized she got goofed on. That was great. I went to dinner with them one night to a steakhouse. And uh, Diane Sawyer was sitting at a table. They had hired four ex-FBI agents who I was going to go sit with on the side. She had her own security. They didn't want me sitting with her on the outside. They were afraid. It's understandable. So I was walking over to the other table and she called out. And she says, Sammy, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go over here with uh, the agents. I said, They're, you know, your team is a little leery of me sitting there. And I understand. No, no big deal. No, no, no. She told the person who was sitting next to her to get up. And she says, come and sit right here next to me. And I, I sat with her and she was like great to talk to. She had a steak like I had a steak. She was just so comfortable of a person, a human being. And really, I really enjoyed that interview a lot. I enjoyed her as a person. I stayed friends with her. I believe I still am. 
Unless she sees this interview or she don't like it. <laughs> we love reason. you, Diane Sawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's yeah. beautiful. I think, but we're still good friends. Yeah. Uh, all these years later. Matter of fact, with that interview, they did another one just not that long ago. It was 25 years later. They put together another interview. It wasn't Diane, but she's a boss. She greenlit it. Another woman came down. She was in charge and yeah. talked to me and stuff. Oh, it's legendary. <coughs> that was legendary, wow. too. Wow, yeah. Yeah, there were two big, big, uh, and each one got millions and millions of views. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Yeah. Pickle Rick. Sammy, you are a ladies' man. Women can be really nasty to men nowadays with the Me Too movement and whatnot. How do I find a nice woman? Love you, bro. Listen, there's nice women all over the place. Um, one thing I could say for sure, as a man, um, I love women. Um, I, love, I enjoy talking with them. I think they're very smart. I always thought women were smarter than men. Uh, when I cheated in school, I always cheated from a, a girl's, uh, what she was writing. I never looked at another guy. But, um, you know, one thing I'll tell women out there, every man on the planet can't stand a nasty woman. Women are beautiful. They got soft skin. They're beautiful. Nice figures, most of them. Good looking smell nice, pleasant, you want to cuddle. That's what men want to do with a woman. The last thing we want is some nasty fucking bitch ripping into us. So if you're a woman, don't do that. It's the worst thing you can do. You don't have to be the best looker. You don't have to have the best body. Be pleasant. Be a woman. We all grow up, men, with mothers, and we all love our mothers or sisters or things like that. And we have a special feeling towards women, not only just sexual, about in a lot of ways. Um, and what we can't stand is a, a, a nasty woman. And um, so what do you got to do? You got to treat a woman the right way. If she's just naturally nasty, and get away from her. But there's thousands, tons of women. Listen, there's women I know now that I'm older that had really tough marriages with guys who just didn't act right in their marriage. And uh, they just need to ha have somebody kind to them, respect them. Um, and you won't find too many women who are nasty if you're give them some special attention. I don't mean you gotta spend a lot of money, you just gotta cherish them. Mm -hmm. Same like you cherish your mother, your sisters, cherish them. They're good people. And uh, that's what you gotta look for. If you're looking for sex right away, maybe you won't, care, you won't get there. But um, if you go with them, I find women to be great to talk to, to deal with. I mean, I found a few in my life that were nasty, and I try to avoid them. You know, all right, pleasure talking to you, goodbye, boop, I'm out. I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm not going to fight with a woman, I'm not going to hit a woman, so I don't want, I just don't want to engage with a woman who's really nasty. So, um, I think you just got to look around, they're not hard to find. Most women, I would say 90-something percent, are good women. And a lot of them had tough lives. And remember, they really do have tough lives. They get pregnant. They have a baby. They take care of babies. They go to work. They cook for you. They clean for you. They do so many fucking things. Put her on a pedestal. And more than likely, you're not going to find nasty women. But it happens. Those women, they're very few, get away from you. That's all I can tell you. Great answer, Sammy. Um, I just read a study that said stay-at-home moms work approximately 96 hours a week, nonstop. Well, without a doubt, there's no question, and in, in, I don't think there's any question in anybody's mind if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, my mother worked in a dress shop. She was a seamstress, and uh, she did everything at home. 
you know, yeah. my father would help with the throwing out the garbage or heavy things like that. He was a good husband. And he was great with us. They would play cards. Even when they were old, they would play cards together. And um, But she worked in a factory and in the house. I don't ever remember being sick without ho hovering over the bed. I mean, uh, she's been a big part of my life. Matter of fact, let me get to Goza Nostra. Goza Nostra, at one point, you had to be, to get made, you had to be, Italian on your mother's end and your father's end, both. Then they, you know, a lot of people came to the United States. They intermarried with other women, other women, and they had kids who were both. Um, they said, "All right, so some of those guys who are growing up, who don't have both, um, we'll take. But you have to be Italian on your father's end." And then you could be, because you carry his name. And then you could be made. I always thought about that, and I didn't believe it. I thought it was wrong. I mean, how could you say that, because he carry his name, I agree with that. But you can't tell me that my mother didn't have some sort of an influence on me. She gave birth to me. She fed me. She bought my clothes. She sewed my clothes. She washed my clothes. She was there whenever I was sick or in trouble. If you don't think that has an impact on the man growing up as a kid, getting to be a man, you're crazy. I think she has more of an impact on you than the father. Because most of the times he's working and he's not involved in the whole thing all the time like she is. So I thought it was the wrong move. I think I wound up being right because uh, there's a lot of guys who were married to different nationality of women and uh, they didn't turn out to be the best in the world. So I think you could almost do that the other way around or you know, just drop the whole thing Forget about carrying the name. I mean, you can't. If, what if she married a black guy? Mm -hmm. A black woman? You mean to say that just because he's got an Italian last name, uh, he's black? I mean, the whole thing don't make sense to me. But I guess years and years ago, they thought of that. Uh, and they try to fix the fact that Italians in Italy, they're, they're both Italian. But when you come here and they intermarried with Jewish women, Irish women, Mexican women, all of that stuff, I mean, you can't just disregard them or you can't disregard because it's the mother's end that we don't care about the mother. You have to. The mother's going to have influence on that kid. I don't care if the father's Italian. The mother's going to have influence. So mm -hmm. I think that whole room was warm. So I, how did this all start with the woman being nasty? Yeah, how do you how do you find a good woman? All right. Okay. Be Ryan. a good man. Be a good man. You'll find a good woman. Hell yeah! Thank you, Sammy. Ryan Brown has a Bruce Cutler question. Um, did he? Did Bruce Cutler defend John for assaulting the truck driver? I believe so. Okay. Yes. Um, Richard Smith with the weekly envelope. No comment. No question. Thank you, Richard. Mets fan, and we'll end on this one, guys. Uh, Mets fan, do you remember, Sammy, when Joe Gallo got whacked in Umberto's clam house? Yes. Yes, I definitely remember that. Um, I was out of the Colombo family, I believe, at that time. And I think I was over with the uh, Gambinos. Um, there was a war. Gallo got out of prison. There was a war. When I was involved in the first war with uh, the Gallos and Carmine Persico and the Columbos. Uh, Colombo wanted Joe Gallo when he came out the second time. The war was over, and he wanted him to come in. Joe Gallo wanted certain areas, certain monies. He was trying to dictate to Joe Colombo who didn't buy it. And he says, come in, we'll talk. He wouldn't come in. 
That created the second war, part of the war. I wasn't in that part. I was in the first part, but not the second part. Um, and uh, they put a contract on him, and he started fighting back, and and he got killed in Umberto's. Uh, he didn't get killed in Umberto's. He got shot in Umberto's. They staggered out to the street, and they shot him again, and he killed him in the street. So, uh, yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. Nice. Thank you, Sammy. So we'll end on this one, guys. Sorry, I wanted to get to this one. El Gato, uh, how did you manage to bribe the juries, jurors? It was easy, El Gato, because every time they're picking a jury, we got cops to, in other words, during the day they would pick people out. And then they got to pick 12, so it goes on for a couple of days, a couple of weeks sometimes to find the jurors. So when they would come out, and we knew they were picked, we would get their license plate, and we would look them up from the cops. So I would find it out. I'm gonna use Amina as one of them. So we would find Amina's. And now we would go to, and we knew who she was, where she lived, who her husband was, who her kids were. Now, a lot of times we would go to somebody like Anna, who knew Amina, and would say, Anna, tell Amina she just hit the jackpot. If she says not guilty, she's going to earn a lot of money. And we'll give her information from lawyers to say, I don't believe the government because of X, Y, Z. So that we always found places to deal. We found a black woman. Now, we would do the same thing. We would get black guys to grab the woman not put pressure on her, tell her you can make a lot of money. Now, black people have a lot of people in prison. They don't particularly like putting people away. So it was easy to get them. Or a garbage man. We have people in the unions, could grab them and talk to them. Sometimes we would actually threaten. Very rare. I didn't want to threaten. I would pay. In the, one of the cases with Gotti, I bribed the, the head juror. And I gave him uh, 60000 I mean, there's all cases in, about it. I gave him 20000 right away, 20000 in the middle of the case, and 20000 at the end. And I was going to give him a job in the Teamsters that he would make anywhere between sixty five and 75000 a year. He agreed. When he agreed, and I gave him the first twenty. I said, remember this. If John Gowdy is found guilty, like, that means you had to agree with it. No matter how much pressure, I'm going to kill you. You could tell the government, maybe I'll be gone. Somebody else will kill you. Once you take this money, you, you will not, under uh, any condition, say guilty. So I did that with him. And sometimes we would do things like that. Um, and that's how John Gotti beat trial after trial after trial. The only trial he couldn't beat is when I cooperated, I was the witness. And when I talked to the government, they understood what went on. And they made the jury inan unanimous. An 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 uh, what do you call that when you're not visible? Um, anan an ugh, I can't anonymous. say. Anonymous. Anonymous. We live in an anonymous. So if they picked, <laughs> let's go back to Amina again. If they picked Amina and she agreed, she would be put into a hotel, picked up and dropped off every day. She wouldn't even go home. They wouldn't allow, so you couldn't grab the jurors anymore. Oh, they sequester them. So, yeah, they sequestered them. So, and, uh, and, and that's what was it. And that's how John beat cases. I was behind all of them, most of them. And I had this guy Bosco, who was the head of the Westies, with that case. He knew the, the head juror. And you're giving him information. At the end, there's a few people want to find him guilty. And then the guy says, listen, I'll stay here for two months. They want to go home. So uh, eventually they give in with whoever's more stubborn. So he's going to be stubborn. Worst comes to worst, if the other guy didn't give in, it's a hung jury, it would start all over again. So... I would uh, send something in with John, with a lawyer. And uh, it was a legal document. 
And on the document, I would put a little head with a body, with two little legs, with two little arms, with a, a noose around his neck and a, and a pole. A little, little cartoon thing. And John, he said, the lawyer would say, Sam, Sammy wants you to read this, John. He'd open up, he'd look at the page, and if he saw that, that's why he was cocky at the trials, he knew I had somebody. And at worst, there would be a hung jury. And that's why he was always smiling and cocky. And he wasn't so cocky when I got pissed. So you were the one who got him his name, the Teflon Don. Me and a, a, a bunch of other people. I, it wasn't me myself. I used other people, like I used Bosco and mm -hmm. other people in and, 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 and different cases. If I used a black guy he, who got a black woman, I didn't speak with the woman he did, mm -hmm. or, or a Mexican. I would talk to the guy, he would talk to the woman, or talk to the man, who, whoever we had who was susceptible. Because I, I don't necessarily need them all. All I need is one or two or three who are going to stay strong, and then the other ones think, I want to go home. I don't want to sit in this fucking thing. What am I, what am I, is it going to be a lifetime job? Got to remember, these trials went on for months. So at the end of it, they want to go home. They're done with it. So now you got two, three people who saying, no, I, I'm, I can't. I'm, it, to me, he's not guilty. And I'll stay here forever. Those people who want to go home, the legit people, they, they, they fold. Wow. They fold. And if they don't, it's a hung jury. Damn, and 60 grand back then is what now? 90 grand? Oh, more, more than 90 grand. And then I gave him 65 to 75,000. And I did that. Now, when I cooperated, he got pinched. And he pled guilty. So the government, the judge, asked him, what's the story? He told word for word what I said, he said. That's what happened. They gave him a lenient sentence because, you know, he told the truth. They were probably checking on me if I was telling the truth. They gave him three years, tap on the wrist. Three years, he does two and change. Not a big deal. And the juries, you're not working or anything when you get called in to be a juror. You can't go to work. You're, it's your full-time job, basically. What? To when you're a juror on these trials, like you're not working. You can't work. No. None of that. No, none of that. Was O.J. Simpson trial was his were, were his jurors um sequestered no i don't think so i don't know but i, I don't think up. so but they could never find him guilty look what they did in that case mm -hmm. um he's a black man they had 11 black jurors you, you, you never heard of that one white juror and 11 black now before that there was a case Rodney something Rodney or other. King? Rodney, the Rodney King beating? Yes. And um, the guy got off and uh, whatever. And the blacks were upset. They were fucking enraged about it. Uh, one of those type of cases. Now, his case, they picked 11 black jurors. So they were enraged and they're saying, fuck him, whatever he did to this white broad. I mean, they weren't going to find him guilty. Yeah. I, I think that's my opinion. I mean, I, and I think that really strong, because he killed the, her and the guy, 100%. the waiter. They didn't know, not even a question about it. And uh, when he went on a civil case, he got destroyed one, two, three. And it was mixed. There was black people in that too. But this was like eleven black. The, the whole thing. What was the white guy going to say? Or oh, white woman, whoever it was. No, not guilty. She's sitting with 11 black people on it. They would have shrunk her up. Well, remember Mark Furman, the detective got up there and they got him on tape saying racist shit? Like, like, he was God saying racist dang. shit. And, and that hurt the, 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 you know, the, the jurors heard all that stuff. No, listen, everything. Listen, he had, uh, who the hell was that black lawyer when he said, if the, if the glove don't fit, you, you must have quit. Johnny Cochran. Johnny Cochran was a fucking great lawyer, theatrical type of lawyer, mm -hmm. and a black guy. And they had F. Lee Bailey on that case. That's right. They had a bunch of really good lawyers, and they played 
the race card. They played everything. And, then, and he won. He won the case. Crazy. Yeah. But it happens, and it goes the other way, too. So, and I think, you know, that's what happens. Well, sometimes it goes one way, sometimes it goes another way. But um, that's why the, the whole jury system, the whole system, really, it doesn't really work. But what do you, what if, what, if you don't have that, what do you have? Right. A couple of judges sitting there deciding your fate, no matter how it goes. You know, these people, at least they're citizens, they're part of uh, society. Now, you can't trust the judges. It's just because he's a judge, you want to trust him. God, Look God. what they just did to Trump. Yep. That's so fucking illegal what they did to this guy is crazy. So the whole system sucks. Um, Ryan Brown with the last super chat for you, Sammy. Joey Testa is scheduled to be free on April 30th. Do you want to tell your viewers, remind them who Joey Testa is, if you want to talk about Montiglio coming out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just, I just did a, an interview, a big interview, um, with uh, Dominic Montiglia. And the, the guy he was living with was this guy, Ross. And we're doing, we did an interview. That's one of the things that's in post right now. You're going to get that in the beginning of April. It's super powerful. It's one of the most powerful ones I've done, I think. Um, it's really, really good. And it talks a little bit about the twins. I give a full-blown answer about them. I knew them both. Um, and uh, I think I should not answer this. Because watch the video, guys. Huh? Tell them to watch the video. Yeah, yeah. Watch this video. It's really important. You'll get my answers and on all of that. And I knew Dominic. I knew the twins. I knew Roy DeMeo. I just did a major, major interview. It's coming out the beginning of April, a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to put out a notice. We're going to put out some teasers. You're going to see my answers right across the board. So uh, sorry I can't. I don't want to answer this right now. But you're going to enjoy that video when it comes out. And, and there's my answers about not only them, but the whole thing. Yeah. All right, guys. I, uh, I got another thing to do in a little bit. I love you guys, so I'm going to give you my normal answer is adios, motherfuckers. <laughs>